Because to me, it's all about the jockey. It's about do you have confidence in the person to actually deliver and have they a good track record? But I think uh, they were interested in tech technology funds at that time and they weren't interested in something like... So I want to thank them for not investing because they don't own the companies. The Architects of Business on Joe, in partnership with the EY Entrepreneur of the Year programme, telling the inspirational stories behind Ireland's most successful entrepreneurs. Hello and you're welcome back to a brand new season of the Architects of Business on Joe in partnership with EY Entrepreneur of the Year. We are going to share the inspirational stories of Ireland's leading entrepreneurs. I'm Sonia Lennon and in this episode I'll be talking to PJ Rigney, the curious mind who created what is now deemed to be the best gin in the world, Drum Shambo Gunpowder Gin. The Shed Distillery, which creates the gin, began life as recently as November 2013 and has grown this remarkable brand into a global force. But gin is just the beginning. I'm, I am a bit confused about whether to address you as PJ or Pat, but I'm going to choose to address you as Pat and we'll come back to the other persona afterwards. Pat, tell us a little bit about your beginnings. Every great entrepreneur has a, a sort of an awakening and a moment where they realise that things aren't necessarily going to go the way they thought. So your upbringing, your background, how did that play out? Well, my background, I guess, I was amongst a family of uh, five boys and my dad was an entrepreneur in the poultry business and in the fish business. So I've always had a, a family business background. Um, and he was an accountant as well, was he? He, he was an accountant, but I'm not. And uh, I'm, I would, you know, but he was an accountant and an entrepreneur and built a business from scratch down in the Midlands, raising uh, day-old poles for sale turkeys. Basically. And a great skill to have that accountancy at the backbone of a business empire. Yes, he was very much a numbers guy, and uh, but also very focused on the customer and delivering a very high quality product. So, so how, how did that impact you then, do you think, in terms of your choices going forward? Well, I ended up doing the BCom after school and um, I knew very early on I didn't want to be an accountant and, and in that space. And I was very fortunate to get a role in, in uh, Sharing's Grants of Ireland in the drinks business back in the early 80s. And I was in the marketing end, which at that stage was, um, I guess it wasn't nearly as sophisticated as it is today. So you were doing everything. But within that space, and then soon after in, um, in Gilby's and in Bailey's, I got involved in new brand development from a very early stage, and I absolutely loved it. I loved creating new brands, opening new markets, working with new people, creating new things. Um, and while I was working on the, the core business, at all times I was always working on something new and something exciting. So, I so early R&D. Early R&D, early uh, trying to understand consumers, what turned them on, what turned them off. Um, experimenting um, and working with some great people, really the Google heads at the time who worked in Bailey's, um, who were pioneers, who were creating um, something very special and really trying to get control of, of a brand that was at that stage was like a stallion running away but trying to manage it, opening up new markets. Um, and I created the Sheridan's brand back in those days. I would have created many other brands, smaller brands, so, so you, you, you took a trajectory which brought you through a number of drinks businesses. Yes. And, and was that um, by accident or by design? It was to a large extent by accident. I just was very fortunate to get a role when I left uh, college. There was very few jobs in those days. In fact, there was two graduate jobs in marketing. One of them was in, in Clonmel, where I went and I worked with Grants of Ireland. And I found out God, this is great, this is like show business, this is a wonderful business to be in. So I'll be honest, it was very much by accident working with great people. Th there's no shame in by accident. <laughs> a lot of by accident happen happens along the way, right? Absolutely, and it was, um, and then one thing led to another, um, and because in, the, in those days there was very few companies in the industry, you could progress quite quickly. And we were at the early renaissance of Bailey's, it, it, was, it was 10 years old and it was, absolutely flying and um, and I was able to, to work with really extraordinary people. And that must have been a global case study at that stage. Yeah, what was interesting about Bailey's at that time, all of it was managed here. It was a 360, so they, they made it here, They all the marketing was done from here, all the finance was done from here, and we were dealing with third-party distributors around the world. So 
it was a very exciting time and they were in control of the business here um, and they were doing something that had never been done before creating a global brand out of Ireland targeting primarily uh, the female consumers but not exclusively and doing it at a premium so it was really like carrying the banner for Ireland around the world at that time it was a very special time and do you find yourself still checking in on progress and, and watching it as a brand yes I would be very proud of what Bailey's have achieved um, for Ireland in terms of our image in terms of quality so I'm always checking in to see how it's doing um, the more recent success would be Jemison, which I'm particularly uh, take great pride in as well. Indeed, all the great Irish brands. I'm just learning about Kerrygold's great success this week in the US and in Germany, where they really, you know, have made a huge impact and are the, the number two butter in those markets. Extraordinary, isn't it? It is. Little tiny island that we are. And it's all about the brand yeah. at the end of the day. So before we get onto that, and I am dying to get onto that, what happened next? So you had been a, a successful, motivated um, employee um, with an entrepreneurial background and history in your upbringing. What was the point that you realised you had no choice? Well, I guess at that stage, you know, I mean, we were doing well. I was doing well in Bailey's, but I mean, we were working hard. Um, I probably wouldn't have looked at it at, in the same way that I was successful, but I was, we were doing well. I was very friendly with another director of Bailey's called David Phelan, and he, I'd worked with him in Plumel, and we were just good buddies, and we said, you know what, if we're gonna do something, let's do something, let's, let's, uh, let, let's, let's move fairly soon and create a, a brand that we could take around the world. So we set up Baru Vodka in 1999 together, and we did that in court. While still an employee? No, or we did left. You, you left? We yeah. left, and that was a real, leap of faith um, but we felt confident in the brand and we did that with uh, with a couple of partners Carberry in West Cork and a company called Terra in County Cavan who helped us with the production and we took that to Ireland and the world in um, 1999 up to 2003. We grew and was that a huge risk for you at that stage? Huge risk and I had no idea how big the risk was until we were involved in that business because we leveraged it to the hilt in terms of the money that went in and the borrowings and so on, but we um, and we made a lot of mistakes in terms of um, you know along the way in terms of maybe how we put it together, how we manage certain aspects of the business overseas. But you know, well, we, what were the mistakes? What were the big ones? Do you think? Well, I think uh, we could have been better on our people management because we didn't really have people management skills for a small scale business. I think we could definitely have done better in that area. I think we should have focused more on the financial side of the business at an early stage, having the right information at the right time. Um, but we got through all of that um, and we started to build a very exciting business. And we, um, we met a great partner in the US and I was in a snowstorm in 2003 in the US with this partner. And he turned around at the, in the snowstorm and said, you know what, Pat, I love what you guys do. Why don't we put my company and your company together? Let's go and float it on the stock exchange. Let's make some money. This is literally over a conversation like this. And I said, hmm, that's interesting. And I rang my partner, David Phelan. And within an hour, I was up at his lawyer's office. And by the end of the day, we had a heads of agreement. And we went off and we, we, um, we followed through on that. Over the next 18 months, we raised we had to raise $10 million, we raised about $25 million for the project, and then we floated the company, the rest is history. So I learned an awful lot along the way. And also, you, one of the key things I learned is that you never know when the, when the knock comes on the door for something like that, and that was a huge piece of learning for us. It's funny because I, I'm, I'm fascinated by uh, the subject of luck, you know? And, and yes. somebody could have said that that was a, a lucky moment, but, I think as an entrepreneur, you get to realize that you create your own luck and you create your own opportunities. To an extent. So go on, I elaborate. I am huge into good karma. And I have learned particularly on the Shed Distillery project, good karma comes from having good people around you and putting yourself into a, into a situation where you're open to opportunities and you're listening for opportunities. And if the opportunity comes up that you, you move on it immediately, you don't let it go. And I am absolutely convinced that our the success, and it's at early stages with the Shed Distillery, much of that is rooted in the good people we're working with and good karma throughout the project. Um, I'm not a deeply religious guy, but I, I believe in all of that. And um, 
we definitely got karma on the Baru project with the people Amazing. we met. Amazing. And so much of it is people, isn't it? It's all about people. And um, the older you get, the wiser you get. I mean, it's... Um, and what we do now in the Shed Distillery project is we hire everybody we hire. It's on character, ability, capability, um, not necessarily on experience. We'll train them. You can um, learn. They can learn. I'm dying to hear all about that, but come back to me for a second. We were at Baru Vodka. Yes. Yeah, so what happened next? So what happened next then? All of a sudden you're a floated oh, company. I'm, a f I'm out, uh, well, I'm no longer, it's floated and I exit at that stage. And then I, um, good karma, um, I decide, well, I'm not going to do one project anymore. I'm going to do several projects. Portfolio be entrepreneur. Because I suppose we were so leveraged and it was so scary with Baru. You know, it could have gone one way, it could have gone the other way, but thankfully it went the right way. So I was walking down the street very soon after, bumped into an old colleague of mine from Gilby's, um, Bailey's, who is the top sales guy in the company. He said, I'm thinking of setting up a drinks company. I said, that's a great idea. For what? <laughs> For distributing brands in Ireland. I said, wow, I'd love to do that with you. And we set up Dalcassian Wines and Spirits in 2005. And today on that company, which is managed by John Dillon, supported by me, we have about 40 employees and we have, we distribute all sorts of wines and spirits across Ireland. So that was one project. Then I set up Fastnet Brands to help people develop their own brands and I work both in Ireland and in Germany and overseas with folks on that. Then I invest... So with uh, uh, young companies helping them to, to grow? Funny enough, mainly established companies. Okay. Yeah, and I do a lot of work in Germany with the number two drinks company, or number three drinks company. Um, it's very interesting. In Germany, they're very good at the functional work, but not necessarily good at the, the emotional side. Mm -hmm. And then there's a gap, so I help them with all their branding. Um, I'm on the board of the Prince of Baden in Germany, the largest landowner. And I help him with all his succession planning, his business and his brand. I'd say there's some good parties there. Yeah, funny enough, they're fairly low-key operators. <laughs> um, but it's interesting, you know, it's, it's, he didn't want somebody from Germany to help him. He wanted, some, he wanted somebody from outside. A remove. Yes. And the Irish have a lot going for them in terms of communication, some of our skills in terms of um, being able to work with people and communicate with them. And we, it's a good marriage. I also invested in Walsh Whiskey, which is another brand, so I'm a director and shareholder of that. And I'm very proud of Ovel Pharmaceuticals, which is a skincare company led by Joanna Gardner. And I chair that and I've invested in that company as well. That's in skincare and they do some really good things. They're, um, they were established in 1934. They're one of the oldest companies in the country. That's amazing. So there you are. So, so I'm let's, let's, I'm going to draw out a little bit because we were starting to touch on it there about storytelling. Um, and very much the work that you do uh, in Germany and and with your own brand. And and before we start to dive into um, Drum Shambo, uh, t talk to me about storytelling in your own career trajectory, because obviously coming from a marketing back <coughs> background, you understand that. But there is a piece around storytelling becoming um, almost a new art form in the marketplace right now. Yes, I th the whole storytelling thing, whether it's in food, drinks, cosmetics or, or whatever, it's, um, it's very much to the fore. As I think consumers become a lot more educated and interested in how brands are created, where they come from, who's behind them. Um, they're certainly looking, for, looking under the bonnet to see how it's made, how it's put together. Is it real? Is it honest? Is it authentic? Is it authentic? But they're also looking for excitement and they they want to be taken away um, they want they want they want to dream a little bit they want um, they want some emotional uh, something that has that's not just a functional brand that actually brings more to the table and makes them feel good about themselves and the people they're with and in some cases makes them look um, makes them look good in front of their peers so and I think um, it's interesting because in the world today, people are maybe a little bit lonelier in some ways. Disconnected. Uh, a little more disconnected. Yeah. And they're, everybody's looking for contact. And one way of connecting is through stories. 
and so it's a way it's almost back to the future. It is because it's uh, that that storytelling piece is is where you speak to the the heart of the person. Yes, you know, so your your consumer decisions are now the equivalent of uh, an entertainment experience that you're getting the same hit that you might have got going to the movies, for example. Yes, consumers are looking for experiences. Yeah, uh, whether it's going to you know, to, to a visitor's experience, as I call it now, not a visitor's centre. They're going out for dinner, they're going going into shop, they're looking online, or they're, they're, they're having a cocktail, they're visiting a bar. It's all about experiences now, and, um, and people will pay a premium for that. So in your travels, um, obviously with uh, your own business and, yes. and through the EY network and beyond, where have you seen that done really well? Gosh, uh, I see it. I see it done really well. Pretty much, I won't say everywhere, but um, I have uh, in, on the wine side in Spain, in Rioja, I would say is best in class in terms of wine experiences. What they've actually done there, in terms of the bodegas and the visit and, and all of that. But it it could be uh, it could be in the Barry Hotel in New York in Manhattan where. You, you walk in and the minute you walk in, you're, you're having an experience and how the place has been renewed in, in the Lower East Side and, and uh, how the reception's put together, how the people communicate with you, what the room looks and touches and feels like. So I think it's everywhere. So, Drum Shambo, The Shed, how did, how did that leap happen? Well, The Shed <clears throat> is something I've been thinking about for a long time and I'd always wanted to develop a distillery um, that would create what I call remarkable brands that would s compete across the world with the best in the world. So Drum Shambu came about again through a bit of an act of God in terms of the location that my parents had met there um, 64 years ago and I knew that but I got a call one day that there was an opportunity to, to locate a business there in the old jam factory, the old Laird's jam factory. This is in December 2013. So I visited there on a rainy day at a time when people were pretty worn out with the crash. So if we can all go back to 2013, if you remember. It I was, do. It was just before <laughs> things got, got, got a little better. So, and on that day, that fateful day, a Saturday, I'm, I was there about 10 o'clock in the morning. The place wasn't in great shape, but the people I met were extraordinary. I met the local people from the town. I met the county manager, and they explained that this facility was leased to the community for 100 years because to try and create employment for, for the area. At what point? It had been leased about three or four years prior. Wow. And it was there, but it wasn't utilised properly. And they were intrigued, but they had a lot of people come and look at the place, but, but walk away and not, not invest. So I just connected with these guys and I rang them on the Monday and I said, we'll go, we'll do it. And in the back of your head, were you thinking, my mother and father met here? <laughs> that was at the back of my head, but at the, but at my, Denise, my wife who's involved in the business was like, wow. And everybody I said was, where's Drum Shampoo? And, uh, but it turned out to be the best decision, we, one of the best decisions we made. So tell us about the evolution of, of the shed and, and what has grown out of the shed. Well, we started very simply with a very simple distillery um, focused on creating uh, what I call Premier Grand Cru Irish whiskey, so the real top end Irish whiskey, single pot still. So that was where we started with no sales, no customers, um, and eventually moving into Drumshamba Gunpowder Irish Gin. And, and was that, let me stop you here now, because there are going to be entrepreneurs all over the country listening to this going, hang on a second. So this was self funded? Yes, uh, it was at the end. Um, I attempted to raise money for the business and I failed completely at that time. There was no faith in the industry back in 2013-14, uh, but I did get support from Enterprise Ireland, which I was very grateful for under the HBSU scheme, and the rest of it I put in myself with my family. Um, so we start, and, and even the bank tur turned me down for a bond. So I said, don't worry about it. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> See you later. I took all the money out of that bank into another bank and got a bond. So, um, And bearing in mind, this is the first business that you've, you, you've, every other business you've set up, you've set up with partners. That's right. The first on my own. Um, but what was really fascinating for me was the questions I was being asked by these so-called startup funds 
had no relation to the business and they hardly asked anything about me. Because to me, it's all about the jockey. It's about, do you have confidence in the person to actually deliver? And have they a good track record? But I think uh, they were interested in tech technology funds at that time and they weren't interested in something like... So I want to thank them for not investing because they don't own the companies. So And I, I, I have to say, this is uh, I know it's a hobby horse of yours and um, your catchphrase? Sales cures all else. That's the fella. And I, I do think um, in the startup sort of infrastructure at the moment, there is a sort of a disease around investment yes. that, you know, you're, the success of your business is nearly the success of your investment. From experience, inv investment is a full-time job. And if you're raising yes. finance, it's very difficult to build a business. Yes. Particularly if you're on your own. So. I spent about a year and I failed on raising the finance. But in the end, it, it worked out to our advantage. In, in many ways, and um, we started off maybe more modestly. We ended up being very resourceful, and you know, then we obviously added in funding as we um, developed cash flow and so on. To re you know, t to a point now where we've, um, you know, with a business that that you know will turn over well over seven million this year, and it's it's only trading just over three years. That's the extraordinary bit of this story: the velocity with which you have made real impact. Yes. But before we get on to that, I just want to talk a little bit about the setup because sure. you spent a year fundraising. It didn't work. Yes. You went anyway. Yes. You grew with stealth and bootstrapped this business. Uh, what, what were the biggest challenges at that point? Well, the first challenge was I knew nothing about distillation. Great. OK. Tick. <laughs> so that's a bit of an issue. Uh, a little bit. So I had to learn all of that. And I was very fortunate, when we go back to good karma, when I was in Germany, I'm visiting my, my prince uh, for, for a meeting. And I woke up one morning in the pension I was staying, and there was an unusual smell in my bedroom. And I went downstairs, and underneath my bedroom, the owner of the house, who was probably about 85 years of age, was distilling. And when I was being collected, I just mentioned this, and he said, wow, they make those stills 10 kilometers from here in Markdorf, which is in the, in the south of Germany. Do you want to go? And I, did, and I said, I'd love to. So we went later that day, and I met a guy called Volker Dietrich, and he actually designed our distillery and built the whole thing. So I had somebody that was world class that helped us, plus a distiller then who joined us from the US. From the US. Because we had no expertise. We're the first distillery in Connacht in over 101 years when we opened. So we had to start with him and train the team. We now have 30 in total. We train them one by one. And where did he get displaced from to come and live in Drumshambo in County Leitrim? Well, he had worked in another distillery in Ireland and okay. had left and was going to head back to the US. And I just happened to find out about him and uh, met him and he married a girl from Sligo, which was pretty handy. That's handy for everybody. That's very handy. <laughs> and now he and lovely for the girl from Sligo, lovely I'm sure. Lovely for the girl from Sligo <laughs> and we're thrilled to have him. His name is Brian Taft and he's a rock star as far as we're concerned. Because not alone is he a great distiller, but he's a wonderful teacher. So he's managed to teach all these folks at the art of distillation, bottling, packing, so on and so forth. Nearly everybody at the distillery was unemployed. Some so talk to me about that and talk to me about the values that you look for. Because we, we touched on that already earlier and I didn't want to get into it because it feels like it belongs in this part of the story. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, you know, we, we are part of the community up there and it, for us to be successful, we need to work very closely with the community. So one by one, people started to join us and what was really interesting, they were unemployed for different periods of time, some up to eight years, five years. Um, but what's extraordinary is how quickly they learned the skills and how they've all retrained, how they all have excelled and how they're all making a wonderful contribution. And it's something that I probably didn't expect, nor my wife, nor uh, John Dillon, who's another director of ours. Um, it's probably the second impact. We, we did no idea this would happen. So they're incredibly resourceful in that part of the country and maybe folks who have been out of work for a while are even more resourceful. We have a, these two who've never worked, but ever, 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 and are now working and they're highly productive. Um, yeah, and it's been, it's been a huge success and it's part of our DNA now.
and it creates real social impact. It does. Huge social impact. I also have a, an extraordinary sales and marketing team of folks who are um, out of college, um, maybe didn't make it into the big top companies. Um, I call them the Spitfire pilots because they're only up in, you know, in the Second World War, you had mm -hmm. six weeks of training and mm -hmm. you flew. These are young, uh, great attitude, great energy, um, working now at a very, very senior level in our company. Um, taking our brand to the four corners of the world. Um, but the most important thing is their courage and their attitude. I'll train them or we'll train them. Um, and that's been another huge piece of learning. So while the college degrees are all very important and very helpful and masters, and really what you want is the right attitude and courage and approach. And you can mould that. You can mould it. So remind us what are the things you look for in your employees? I think the most, well first, well, we're looking for a good attitude. People who will work together, who are flexible, who are resourceful, who are of a good work ethic, hard working, and after the good character, and after that, we train them. It's funny because one of the pervasive issues of business in our time is culture. Yes, yes. We have the opportunity to create a culture from zero. And because I was so fortunate to hire Brian Taft on the production side, he has helped really create a very good culture because he's a great teacher. And we were starting off from zero. And we were starting off creating skills for folks who had no experience and we could train them. I think you're being overly modest, I'm going to say, because I think a lot of companies start from zero and don't end up, end up with good cultures. I think what you as a leader have brought to the table, dare I say, is really good human values that have created yes. the experience of working in Drum Shambo. It's, that's what it sounds like from the outside. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you're probably right. I'm we, making you we, blush we, now, we, we, am we I, Pat? <laughs> we tend to, we tend to keep a, yeah, we're, we, we tend to just stay very, I mean, working in Leitrim, they tend to be low-key operators. Yes. And, um, None of your guff. No, they don't take too much guff. And um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting that you say that because we had the Whole Foods buyer over from the US um, recently, you know, who are now bought by Amazon.com and she visited the distillery and she said, this is the most emotional, incredible distillery I've ever visited. And by the way, you're way too modest, you guys. I said, well, that's Ireland. She said, that's I don't, our thing. She said, I don't care. You're way too modest. You need to, you need to blow your trumpet a bit more. But um, we, we tend to keep a low profile. Okay, we're going to take a short break and then we're going to come back on modestly creating remarkable brands. Thank you. The Architects of Business on Joe, in partnership with the EY Entrepreneur of the Year programme. So we promised we'd come back with your great topic, building remarkable brands. So I know that this is um, something that you talk about a lot. And I suppose given the accolades and... Uh, Am I right in thinking best gin in the world at the Gin Oscars in New York? Well, they, there's, there's, there's these Oscars in New York. Yes. You don't enter it. Right. You're not allowed to enter. There's 22,500 brands that they look at and they choose five brands every year. And we are one of the five and it's voted by a, up to 400,000 folks on this platform called Flaviar. So we were very fortunate. All gins, five gins? No, no, it's... Um, no, it may By not. By category? It, it, no, it's not. It's just the best five brands in the world. And uh, so it just happened, in our case, to be a gin. Well, no, it just happened to be your gin. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that modesty coming out again. Well, we're very chuffed with it. and That's extraordinary. It is. For us, it's, it's, it's tremendous. But it's what we're hearing from consumers right across the world. They do love the brand and... They love the story behind the brand and more than anything, they love the experience of drinking the gin. And isn't that everything? Because if, if, if the product doesn't stand up to the story... Yeah, you, in fact, you, your, pro, your product has to exceed the story and, and we've, we've tried to do it. Drumshamba Gunpowder Irish Gin is exceed in terms of the delivery. It's distilled with Oriental Botanicals and Gunpowder Tea. It's done in a very unique way. And everything we do at is all done at the distillery. So we do the full distillation, the packing, the bottling, and so on. So I know 
everybody watching is going to want to know, what is that process like when you sit down with a blank sheet of paper, you know you're going to make a gin? And am I right in thinking that the gin happened because the whiskey was distilling? Not exactly, because okay. when we set up the distillery, we set up the distillery as a multi-purpose distillery. Okay. So we have our three copper pots working on Irish whiskey. Which doesn't happen overnight. No, and it'll be almost five years before we release it at the end of this year. Then we have another copper pot working on our gin, another one on vodka, three column stills. So we always intended to do this. And I've traveled all over the world for so many years. And I'm kind of known as the curious mind amongst everybody who knows me. So this whole story around from Shambhal Gunpowder Irish Gin is built around the curious mind of PJ Rigney, where I picked up botanicals along the journeys of many of my journeys from the Orient <coughs> and brought them back, mixed them with meadow sweet in Ireland and created this wonderful gin. Amazing. So that's the concept of the product. What happens next? Sorry. I Go for it. <laughs> it's thirsty work. <laughs> um, well, I mean, obviously then you need to, to express that in a form of, that's going to connect with consumers in terms of the packaging, the presentation, the story, the communication. And uh, so this is how the brand actually Fabulous. has come to life in, the, in this pack. Um, in and this, this even the outer packaging is quite unusual, isn't it? Yes, and, and I have this wonderful design team who work with me and my team to create this brand, everything from the glass to the label to the presentation. Um, and we work very much in a hands-on and collaborative way. I also had the support of Borbia on the thinking house on this project as well. So they helped me on the consumer insight. So side. we will have um, listeners who don't have the benefit of visuals here. So describe the packaging for us. Well, the, the primary pack is this this blue bottle with uh, with um, with a very tactile effect, white label with um, soft blue embossed with a uh, jackalope at the, the center of it. Some Chinese writing on the, the right side here, which means gunpowder tea, which is, um, it's known as from Shamba Gunpowder Irish Gin. So one of the key ingredients is gunpowder tea. I have to ask you about the jackalope. The jackalope is something that I've always wanted to put on a pack. It's a mythical animal that uh, has some connection with Drum Shambo, but probably more connection with me and uh, the curious mind. And I just love jackalopes. I've always loved them. I have never heard of a jackalope before. Yeah, well, they're they're pretty f famous in the US, but um, this is the first one ever to arrive in, in Drum Shambo. And the bottle is then surrounded by a sort of a, a quite an unusual outer cardboard shell with the, the top of the bottle exposed. Yeah, and, 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 and at even, even the the glass is cosmetic glass, so it's the very high, highest quality glass. Our cork is um, made of wood with, uh, with a brass deboss. So everything that we do with the brand is very high quality, very tactile, very touchy, very feely. And really, you start to experience the brand once you see it, once you touch it, and then obviously once you drink it, then you get the full experience. And so presumably you taste tested and you uh, did competitor analysis and were you, uh, this is a terrible question to ask in one way, but were you able to put your hand on your heart and say, this is the best tasting gin? I think so. And with our tremendous distiller, we actually made a couple of significant changes in terms of how it's actually distilled in order to do that. So first of all, we have a unique still that is dedicated to gin. It doesn't distill anything else. And would that be an unusual thing? It would be, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, we do, we do also distill everything ourselves. So everything that goes into the bottle goes through our still. We have a vapor basket on the side where we only use fresh citrus. We take the cut of the gin, at a, at a, it's a very tight cut, I won't give it all away, but it's a very tight cut. <laughs> I'm going home to make it now at this yeah. stage, Pat. <laughs> so that's at the alcohol level. So, um, and then we rest for 21 days. And then we do a very light cold filtration, so we leave the I'm essential I'm sure it's oils. more a case of the alcohol resting than you <laughs> resting, I can imagine. But well, we don't rest too much. <laughs> but, um, and then you get this wonderful experience. Is the smell fantastic in the facility? It, the smell is fantastic, yes. It absolutely smells, and the, and the botanicals smell wonderful. So you've created this remarkable brand. It tastes wonderful. It looks world class. What is that? connection point then with the customer? What, what, what brings closure on the sale? Well, I guess, I mean, 
when we put this together, I had no idea that the brand would resonate so well with consumers around the world, or indeed the gatekeepers who you have to get past to get to the consumer. Um, I, when we did the designs and we did the work, and I work, by the way, directly with the design team. I don't work through a middle person, so I work just directly with them. And, and is the design team in-house? No. It's an agency? Yes, and they're based on the island of Ireland. All our photography, all our design is done here with this amazing team. Um, so I, we have this, what I call a kind of a, just an interaction that's very unique. Um, we do, I have a vision, but, and I'm a very visual guy, but at the end of the day, there's a lot of trial and error. I also would have a team in Doc Cassian Wines and Spirits with John Dillon, where we'd, I would stress test ideas and visuals with them and my own team. And is that a focus group situation? Not necessarily, no. Not for that, because I don't think focus groups are right for design. This would be, what do you think? Am okay. I on the right tracks? And, you know, and then at the end of the day, I have to make a decision. This is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. And um, so there's a huge leap of faith in this. And if you actually look... Not for look, the first time. Not for the first time. <laughs> but if you look at a lot of what we've done, if you look at this pack and you look at a lot of what we've done in, with sausage tree purage vodka and other stuff, it actually doesn't stack up. So, so if you technically, a, analytically, it, you can't make a science out of this? No, there's a huge art in this. Um, there's a science in terms of process, but at the end of the day, some of the elements we brought together don't normally sit together. Um, and you're looking for that connection, you're looking for that X factor. And so you have to trust your instinct. You have to trust your gut. Um, if we put something like this through the normal process, it wouldn't look anything like this. It'd all be all very proper and very everything in the right and, and place. And possibly a little more boring. A lot more boring. And one of the things we're picking up from consumers is that while they like, they want to know that, that our brand is made the right way and we do it, they want some excitement and they want a story and they want they want the emotion and they want to know that there's a curious mind who's travelled all over the world and has done all of these amazing things and they they, they love that. and. We take great pride in the fact that, and my team take great pride in the fact that it's been embraced by so many people in Ireland, but and also overseas. And in terms of, uh, I, I love that tension between the gatekeepers and the consumer yes. for a business, you know, because regardless of your sector, if you are consumer facing, that exists because somebody always holds the keys to the kingdom in terms right. of whether it's broadcasting or whether it's the supermarket shelf. Did you find yourself in situations where the consumer had a voice to the gatekeeper? Well, I give you, <clears throat> there's been a couple of interesting things that happened that were kind of early on that kind of made me sit up. Um, one was the target buyer in the US. Um, he he was presented with the brand. And he, he said, this is very good. Um, and I, apparently he took it home and showed his wife the brand. And she said, this is amazing. So he comes back in and he, he goes from one store to 200 stores pretty much immediately because he, he saw an immediate reaction, and obviously people around the um, around the, the the target office had the same the same feeling. So, what's interesting about this brand is that it just seems to connect with people from all sorts of backgrounds, whether they all sorts of nationalities. And I'm big into the first two or three seconds. Do people get it? Do they connect? Because if they don't. You've got to spend a lot of money to get them to connect, and we don't have that, those resources. We're I have I have to go back to the logistical nightmare in my head now because I, I'm thinking one store to two hundred target stores in a U.S. market. What sort of pressure does that put on the business? Um, well, it sounds like a lot, but it's 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 and it is a lot, and we're delighted to have it. But it's we're well able to cope with that because. Okay. We just hire more people, um, and we we do it in a very um, yeah organised so way. So the facility can flex to it meet can. demand. Yeah, we're very flexible. That's one of the great things about the team. Very flexible, and you know we've added a lot of people, a lot of facilities. We put in a proper bottling facility. So yeah, we're able to go with the flow um, so far. But you know we don't take anything for granted. And while you know we we're doing well and we're growing the business. I'm, 
I sleep with one eye open. So. <laughs> Because you never know what's around the That's corner. That's for sure. That's for sure. And I suppose that flexibility is almost a symptom of resourcefulness. Yes. I mean, one of the things that I've learned on this project is some of our greatest successes in terms of activation of the brand or communication of the brand have cost us the least amount of money. And it's about having great resourcefulness around how we communicate the brand. And in fact, consumers today do not want to be overly marketed to. They want to find the brand for themselves and you need to help them find the brand for and themselves. communicate appropriately. And communicate appropriately. Our team at the distillery have done extraordinary things in terms of maybe repairing a machine or, or moving things around. They do lean them uh, themselves. Um, they have their own lean system. Um, we I was going to ask you that. It sounds like lean is really embedded in the way you operate. It, it is without formally doing it. And that's yeah. down to the culture led by our distiller. And the same with our sales and marketing team both in The Shed and Dalcassian, they are very um, flexible, yeah. um, sharing tasks, um, working together. Um, and that's something that's going to, that's critical to our DNA. The key thing now is to maintain that. And it's not only critical to your DNA, it's critical to your success because you are in competition with behemoths, like monsters. Yes. I think you call them the gorillas. Well, there's, we're, we're in competition with very large companies, that's for sure. And, you know, we are really pushing into the export market now. And that's, that's where we see great opportunity is, you know, in North America, continental Europe. We've just got a listing in Hong Kong Airport, uh, which we're very proud of, um, Sydney. So, but we're up against very large companies. So we need to be nimble, highly innovative. We need to be, um, and we need to communicate with, with consumers in a very... Um, I suppose in a very quick and easy way, because we don't have the resources of the big, the big companies, who I think are quite respectful of what we do, to be honest, and, sure. and, and I think quietly impressed. So you are at a sort of a, a pivot point of the company now, where you're looking at a, a much higher rate of growth. What are the challenges that you can see or foresee coming down the line? I think the challenges for us is to, the first thing is to ensure that we deliver the, the brand experience for our consumers, our loyal consumers in Ireland and across the world, that we continue to excite them and surprise them. That's number one, because that drives everything. I think the second challenge is, is as we grow our team, to maintain our culture, um, maintain the DNA, and pass that through the organization, and I'm working very hard on that. And then obviously on the, on the production side to make sure that we, as we expand, that we, we don't over expand and just try and, you know, keep, 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 it, keep it going in the right way. Um, and uh, so they're probably the key challenges. How valuable then as a network is the EY Entrepreneur of the Year family, as it's been called? Well, it's for me. I mean, I'm am a new member of the the network, and, and I was congratulations. Thank you very much. I was nominated last year, and honestly, when I was nominated, we were so busy with the project, I I didn't know very much about the EY program. And when I went on the the retreat, I was and met all the people involved. I was blown away with really for the first time in a long time I was meeting people like me I didn't think they existed your tribe <laughs> my tribe and it was it was tremendous it was very refreshing um, it was all it was, it was an extraordinary experience to be on the program for the year I'm very excited about it this year being involved with the program but for me it's it's actually connecting with people who are similar to, to me um, it's a relief that there are other people like that out there <laughs> and and listen it's we, we, we benefit from each other uh, in so many ways. I was on the EY Energizer, um, picked up loads of new ideas. On the retreat, I picked up several ideas which I've implemented in the business. Um, you know, Because if you're in the right network, the answers are in the room. The answers are in the room, yes. They are in the room. Uh, but sometimes it's, a lot of it's just, it's almost like a, a head cleanser just to go and spend time with these folks. Yeah. And you just feel, well, actually, at the end of the day, you know what? I'm actually doing okay. Because 
I'm just listening to somebody else's horror story or whatever. <laughs> and, uh, the horror stories are nearly more inspiring than the success there's, stories. There's no shortage they? of them. <laughs> and so you have, um, very soon, I believe, you're opening a new visitor experience. Is that right? We actually start to, we start to build um, the week after next. So we will build what we hope will be a really fantastic visitor's experience in the Hidden Heartlands um, of Drumshambo. And we Is this an official title? No. <laughs> I think it is now. It is now. <laughs> the Hidden Heartlands, you heard it here first. Brilliant. Yeah, and we'll open it this time next year. Amazing. And we'll another I have 20 people, hopefully, on the payroll. That's fantastic. Please, God. I have one final question for you. Why is your business successful? My business is successful, my God. I think there's no, the core of the success is the people that I have built around the business. My wife, my family, John Dillon on the Dalcassian side. These were these were remarkable people with good karma. And you bring that together and uh, nothing can stop you. Pat, remarkable people, remarkable brand. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>